Hi, and welcome to the Lessons from Lab and Life podcast. I'm your host, Lydia Morrison, and I hope that our podcast offers you some new perspective. Our podcast today focuses on molecular cloning. I'm joined by senior scientist Bill Jack from the research department here at NEB, and today we'll discuss where the concept of cloning began, how it works, and where it's headed in the future. Hi, Bill. Thanks so much for joining me today. Happy to be here. Thank you, Lydia. So we're here to discuss molecular cloning. And I think when people hear the word cloning, they think of a lot of different things. Sheep, sci-fi movies, and who knows what else. So could you tell our listeners, what is the definition of molecular cloning? You know, we really have stolen that definition from the botanist, uh, which is if you go to the dictionary, the clone is an exact copy of something. Similar to taking a piece of paper, walking over to the copy machine, pushing the button, and having a copy come out. In plants, you can think of it very easily. I'm sure all of you have gone out and taken a plant and split it and put it in two different locations. That's really exactly identical information there in those two plants that's been put in those two different places. We've taken that to mean cloning on a molecular level, meaning to make copies of specific pieces of DNA. And that's really where the molecular biology of cloning comes in. Now, maybe we can talk in a little bit about some of those other sheep and science fiction and Star Wars drones and other kinds of cloning. But for a basic definition, it really is just a molecular copying of pieces of DNA. And who invented molecular cloning? There are several advances that came in to allow molecular cloning to occur. But it's basically Stanley Cohen and Herb Boyer that are credited as being the first molecular cloners and making recombinant DNA. This was really preceded by a number of advances. Uh, Stanley Cohen's lab had been instrumental in showing that you could take small, autonomously replicating DNA circles in bacteria and easily transform them or put them into other bacteria. They were also able to identify selective markers on those plasmids, such as antibiotic resistance, which allowed not only the transformation, but also the strong selection for any bacteria that had obtained that plasmid. Later on, the advance of the introduction of a few key enzymes, first of all, DNA ligase, which glues pieces of DNA together, and the second, restriction endonucleases, which cut DNA in specific spots and leave sticky overhangs that allow ligation to occur. Those two enzymes really revolutionized the ability to be able to take a foreign piece of DNA stick it into these plasmids, these autonomously replicating circles, and put those back into bacteria and have not only that plasmid replicate, but also that inserted piece of DNA. So that's really the underlying scheme of what constitutes molecular cloning, namely just making more copies of a specific piece of DNA. Why is molecular cloning important? It has allowed us to be able to take very small and selected regions of DNA and make multiple copies of that. With the multiple copies, it's made it much easier for us to analyze the, for example, the DNA sequence, the Mm -hmm. content of those, the genes that are contained within those pieces of DNA, and also has allowed us to move our technologies into actually making the gene products from those particular pieces of DNA. All those kinds of analysis really have been enabled just because we've been able to make multiple copies that makes it obviously a lot easier to be able to analyze those DNAs. Why does molecular cloning require a host? You know, in the simplest form, we probably could do many of the things in a test tube. We can amplify DNA very well today with a polymerase chain reaction, PCR. However, bacteria have already been doing this for millennia, and so they're very good at it. They're very efficient at making the DNA. Uh, The bacteria are easy to manipulate, easy to extract high quantities and quality of DNA from the bacterium. In fact, the fidelity of DNA made in bacterial hosts is much higher than we can ever do in the test tube. Interesting. So for these reasons, it's really just a matter of convenience for us to use bacteria to do that. That doesn't mean that there won't be specialized situations in which we don't want to make the DNA outside in a test tube. But really, the bacteria are such a good manufacturing machine that it seems infeasible for us to use any other method on a large scale. And where are we with cloning today? Well, the roots of cloning go back into the 70s. And so we have a good 40-some-odd year history of doing cloning. And we've certainly grown in appreciation of the things that we can do with cloning, the techniques and the speed with which it's done. 
I've been in the field for a little over 35 years, and it's remarkable to me to see the speed at which things can be done now in terms of making clones, in analyzing the clones, and producing the clones. So we continue to be able to assemble more and more pieces together in a single clone, in a single pass. We continue to have increases in the ability to modify the DNA that's been inserted in the clones. We also continue to have better ways and faster ways of purifying the DNA from bacteria when we put them in. So we really are continuing to move the advances, and I think that there really are more advances ahead of us, fortunately, that will continue to make this process even easier and even easier to analyze. How is molecular cloning used today in synthetic biology? So synthetic biology, in my own definition, would be putting together multiple genes and pathways to be able to study how the different proteins interact. Much of molecular biology and biochemistry has been necessarily based on study of individual enzymes, Mm -hmm. purifying the individual enzymes, looking at their properties, and trying to analyze them in terms of what their structure might be and how they might perform their individual activity. However, the field increasingly has been turning to looking at multiple complexes of proteins together and how they act. The ribosome or the DNA replication complex would be two examples of that. And certainly those have been studied through the years, and yet once we have a number of proteins together, the analysis has been much more difficult to appreciate what the individual components do in order to make that entire complex work. I think our visualization processes today, in terms of advances in X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM has made great advances in being able to look at large complexes. Mm -hmm. And now the ability to make multiple proteins at the same time and have them assemble in complexes gives us an ability to be able to look at that in even more detail. And so I believe that one of the uses of synthetic biology will be a turn towards broadening our scope, being able to take individual enzymes and look at them in complexes. My hope is that a lot of that can be done actually in vivo within cells so that an entire metabolic pathway can be constructed inside a cell. We can let all those components be expressed and come together and perform their action and that we will develop better techniques for actually analyzing the complexes as they operate in vivo. So I think that's one element of synthetic biology that I'm excited about that I still think has a lot of development to do. The second one is using the steps of synthetic biology to actually make precursors or drugs of interest. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of our drugs come from natural sources, at least the original ones do. The antibiotics are a prime example of that coming from bacteria. Sure. And those are all made from multiple steps within the cell. The precursors are built up one step at a time. Mm. It's been found that the synthetic biology has been able to take those individual enzymes, put them together on an expression construct, and therefore replicate a lot of what has had to been done in the vat of chemicals within an organic chemistry lab. Hmm. Now, that's not to say that this will take the place of all organic synthesis, but some of these precursors are exceedingly complex. And particularly before we understand the detailed structures of those, using these pathways and using bacteria as factories to make at least precursors, if not the final product, is also a very attractive element of synthetic biology. Yeah, that's really interesting. So how does molecular cloning enable the production of a transgenic organism? (laughs) There we're going to a different realm because the cloning that I've been talking about is really just individual pieces of DNA being put together. Sure. The cloning that we talk about when we're talking about Dolly the sheep or Mm -hmm. something else is really at a different level. Now, it's easy to think of cloning in terms of bacteria because as they reproduce, they essentially just take everything, split it in half, and divide. Okay. And so each bacteria is essentially an identical copy of the parent cell. Mm -hmm. Once we introduce sex, we've got problems because... It gets complex. It gets (laughs) complex. And in that case, all the progeny have a contribution from both the mother and the father. Mm. And it's not always predictable how those things will go together. And so even if we take purebred strains and strains that are identical and mate them together, we still have some differences between them. That's as close as we really get with higher organisms using sexual reproduction to having clones that result out of the mating. In the case of Dolly the sheep or other uh, transgenic animals like that, we actually are able to take the same eggs and split them up, let them divide and take individual eggs that have identical contents and put them into multiple animals. 
And in doing that, we are actually able to make identical copies of the same animal. And so that's really what we're talking about with transgenics animals, being able to make identical copies because we start with identical starting materials that haven't been mixed around by some sexual process. Hmm. And so how does molecular cloning apply to something like gene therapy? Gene therapy involves the change or alteration of genes that are already in the body. And so the molecular cloning is probably not the best term to really refer to that. We would certainly use the principles of molecular cloning to develop molecules that could be used to go in and guide the alterations in the genome that would be there. In a larger sense, it's the machinery that drives that ability to make those genetic changes and target those to the regions that we're interested in without targeting other places themselves. And so it is important because it is easier to manipulate the individual DNA molecules in a test tube and then use them in bacteria. It's easier to examine those, make sure we have exactly what we want to introduce into the higher organism, Mm -hmm. and then introduce those and then go through and very carefully screen and analyze whether we've made the specific changes we want. That becomes feasible when we think about some simple genetic diseases, things like sickle cell anemia, which is whose genetic basis is a single change in the DNA code that is encoded in the genome. If we could go back and just correct that one single base, it certainly has the prospect of curing that disease. Hmm. Again, we are doing those sorts of things with animals. The application of that to humans is still a little ways off. We're still proceeding very cautiously because we want to make sure that the changes we make are very specific and are not broadly introduced into the genome where it might cause other deleterious effects. Absolutely. And I guess in thinking along those same lines, What are the current challenges or limitations of performing cloning today? I mentioned a few, and let me go back to those because I think they're important. We have a prospect of putting together more and more pieces within a clone. The early days of cloning really took two pieces of DNA, joined them together in a circle, and used them. Today, we have a variety of techniques that would ask us to put together not just two pieces, but maybe five, 10, 20, or even more. And the advances in cloning have come down today to be able to make that really practical. For example, the Golden Gate assembly system, if correctly designed, has been demonstrated to be able to assemble up to in excess of 20 pieces with greater than 90% efficiency of getting the correct clone. That's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. And it's really based on fundamental work that's been done on the biochemistry of the joining reactions between DNA pieces so that those can be intelligently designed to be able to come together in a desired way. The other thing that is of interest is to be able to put together longer and longer pieces and have those stably maintained. It's a little bit separate from the problem of putting together multiple pieces in that when we put together long pieces of DNA, we need to make sure that they're maintained stably within the host that we put them in. And there appear to be some limits in bacteria Mm -hmm. as to how big a piece can be stably maintained partially based on how many copies of those individual plasmas or circles of DNA that there are in the cell. There is a need in the field to identify ways of putting together and stably maintaining longer pieces of DNA. So those genes, arrays that I talked about, can actually be manipulated and put together well. It's a problem of manipulation outside of the cell as well as inside the cell. And I think that there are a lot of advances now that are coming forward. Things approaches people are working on that will help us to solve that problem. And in forward thinking, where do you see cloning technologies heading in the next five to 10 years? They should continue to advance as they obviously have. Just when we think we've reached a peak, someone comes up with a new technique, which is even better, faster, and more efficient at assembling pieces. The continual need for having assemblies of larger number of pieces and longer pieces will continue to drive that innovation. I believe that the emphasis will be on, as I said, putting together a large number of pieces and will be increasingly on the fidelity of synthetically manufactured pieces of DNA Mm -hmm. and being able to make sure that those are produced with high quality. We've already seen a real revolution in the way that we work and manipulate DNA sequences that we want. It's become much more cost-effective now to order large blocks of DNA and have them made synthetically 
than it is to try to go out and to find them in their native sources and clone them. Mm. This has also revolutionized the ability to take environmental samples and being able to pull particular DNA sequences out of those. For example, there have been a large number of expeditions that have gone to various sites in the world, pulled out DNA from all the organisms existing in that particular environment, and then done random sequencing of those. Hasn't required any culture of organisms in order to get those sequences. Yet once that you have that sequence, you're kind of stuck because you don't have the original organism to go back to mm-hmm. to try to clone that gene out of. With synthesis methods, we can go ahead and synthesize that gene and see what that gene does, even though we don't have the original organism there with us to work with. And so it does give us an ability to move beyond what we could normally do, because I think it's been estimated, oh, I'm going to miss the number here, but something like less than 10% of the organisms in the oceans can actually be cultured in the laboratory. So we really have a very small view of what the entire world looks like. Synthetic biology allows us to look at and recreate those pathways, the enzymes that occur in those organisms. And I look for that to be an even more important element of our studies going forward. That's really interesting. And I would think that that would be really important for conservation efforts as well, um, to be able to categorize um, and catalog the organisms that you might just have a very small sample of or a single sample. Oh, that's really true. Really true. A lot of the conservation efforts to date have been trying to preserve identifiable organisms from the marine uh, environment. Mm -hmm. The Ocean Genome Legacy at Northeastern University, which had its foundations at Biolabs, had been on that task for uh, 20, 25 years. But being able to pull out those genetic resources from those organisms that we can't cultivate certainly is a reservoir that we just really haven't tapped. Very important. Thank you so much for joining me today, Bill. This has been a really interesting conversation. I love hearing that the application of science, even when you're talking about molecular cloning in a lab, is really being applied outside of the lab to field research and conservation efforts all over the world. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I share your enthusiasm and excitement about seeing things that we consider kind of basic research, really having an application and making a real difference in solving people's problems and helping us to have a more holistic view of the world and conserving its resources. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of our podcast. As always, check out the transcript of this podcast for links to additional information. Hope you'll join us next time for a discussion about the intersection of art and science with Scott Chimileski, who's a postdoc at Harvard Medical School and co-curator of Microbial Life, a universe at the edge of sight, currently on exhibit at the Harvard Museum of Natural History.